very much for being here. I hope you will uh, at some point get some alcohol if required, but I hope you'll unmute. Uh, I hope you'll take off the uh, 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 screen covers on your cameras. Thanks, Gary. And uh, let's make it interactive because as I was mentioning earlier, we might throw up a couple of slides uh, to get us pushed off of the dock, uh, but we'd really love to have some conversation all around uh, and I'm going to get started, Ames, if I can. Is that okay with you? Oh, please do, Grant. I'm looking forward to it again. We had a great session yesterday. I think we can top it again today. We have a lot of faces on screens and look forward to interactivity. As, as, uh, as Grant said, we really want to make this something that's valuable for your time, not just in improving your cooking and uh, taking care of your appetite, but also uh, giving you some food for thought in identity and, uh, and in uh, security. Thanks. So I was thinking, you know, how to set this up instead of going on this long diatribe about checkpoint and everything. I really wanted to kind of talk more in the context of zero trust, because for me and I hope for all of you, you know, it really encompasses everything with this digital transformation that's been forced on us over the course of the last year. And certainly priority has shifted to securing you, your users, wherever they are, from whatever device they're on. And because so much of what we're using is the cloud, uh, it, it really is very relevant. And I think that uh, just to quickly run through a few drivers that I think you're all going through. Uh, these are the things that are, and, and you know, zero trust is a big effort. I, I remember I was asked to speak on it a little while ago uh, and the outline they gave, it was sort of like they're looking for me to speak on how a tennis racket was made. I mean, very, very fundamental. And I, I said, hey, this, Zero trust is so much bigger than that. This is a philosophy. It's a concept. It's not a product. And there are a number of undercurrents that are fueling this, uh, I think, fairly uh, significant move to zero trust or zero trust architectures. And many of the things are what we already know. Um, this is just for fun. Uh, does anyone know when zero trust became an official term? Come on, un -mic, un unmute, shout it out if you got any ideas. Nobody cares. <laughs> it, it, it was actually, I found it quite surprising. Uh, it was a while ago, <laughs> you know, 2010, I mean, over a decade ago. So it's something that we've been... Uh, aware of discussing for quite some time. And I really do feel that the acceleration has uh, been fueled by what we've all went through. So just so we're all on the same page of the hymnal, uh, uh, the concept or what zero trust is, I also wanted to capture it. And you could see that the minute you start using words like anything inside or outside, <laughs> you know, that, that starts to involve just about every aspect of our compute environment. And so I thought this might be a fun, fair way to push this whole discussion about uh, our great partner. And as you all know, that's what we're all about. Checkpoint is about partnerships. Um, we're not about uh, trying to do everything on our own because the fact of the matter is we know we can't. Uh, and it's why I'm here with Ames to talk about the myriad and multiple authentication schemes, concerns that you really need to have when you start to look at really trying to architect a, a zero trust environment. So with that, uh, Ames, Thanks, what do man. you think of this zero trust effort we're under and how are people doing? Well, I really, uh, I, I appreciate that you bring up the, uh, the sort of beginning of zero trust so long ago, over a decade really. And uh, 
And um, I, I don't know how long you've been married, Mark. Um, maybe that decade has, uh, has gone on. Uh, that definition of zero trust uh, certainly does encompass that, doesn't it? <laughs> I tell you that it, it's interesting, the parallel, though, because you, you said it, it's in the chat. If, if you have followed the chat, Mark said the day after my wedding. Uh -huh. uh, yes, zero trust all of a sudden has <laughs> encompassed that. And it really did, right? That day was the day that your perimeter moved, or I guess you should say her perimeter moved. And she all of a sudden had to figure out, what do I do with where my, my home office was? And now I've invited this partner in, and this partner has expanded my risk and threat perimeter. Uh, and, uh, and part of that is so appropriate, it's such a great comment because zero trust is really <clears throat> about looking at a situation and saying, okay, who can I trust, right? So it, it did start with the notion that if I got into the building with a key card and I'm sitting down at my computer in my cubicle, then you know the notion is I, I ought to be trustworthy and everyone in the office should be, right? And so therefore I've already passed a, a risk check uh, because I got into the building and some buildings had security cards and simply by getting into the security uh, zone, I passed one of the risk checks and therefore I could uh, maybe even forego some of the more advanced security. Although we were still logging into our desktop and, uh, and that brings up another thing about the notion of zero trust so far back was that first, that first Forrester research was really about, look, we need to take security seriously and it's everyone's responsibility. And we shifted 100% of the security concern to the user. Now, certainly we had security teams, but the, but the predominant uh, re response to security was to say, okay, user, here's what you get to do now. You get to have an immensely long password. And because that's not good enough, we're gonna make you change it and we're going to do it on a nice onerous schedule, like monthly. Oh, I guess we'll let you go quarterly. Uh, and so now we're going to do that to you. And that's security. And by doing that, we've put up this security perimeter. Um, we're going to make sure that you can't even access remotely. Unless, of course, you're a special user, in which case you can get on the VPN. And you have to be trained on the VPN. And this was zero trust. This was the secure perimeter. Well, it's matured a lot, hasn't it, Grant? Now we're looking at zero trust from a completely different perspective, aren't we? It's uh, well. I, I was just looking for this slide, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put it up, and I'm gonna get out of the way. And I think you know this is this is why it becomes challenging, right? When you step back and you look at what it is you're trying to create a zero trust architecture for, right? This I think also highlights the need for a comprehensive platform and partnership and ecosystem of solutions because this is a vast and wide environment. It's uh, gone are the days of just the perimeter. And in fact, I would suggest if you haven't seen it, go to YouTube and look up, um, uh, uh, Let's see how I'm trying to remember exactly the title. The perimeter is here. It is the perimeter is dead. Long live the perimeter. <laughs> and, and, and it's about the notion that's going on right now on the transformation of the perimeter from around our castle to around virtually every single microservice every attribute, every component, every, uh, you know, uh, person, of course, but we're going to start to see identity take over, right? A and that will be essential to moving forward. Isn't that how the world is moving? Absolutely. And in fact, I'm going to uh, just grab up a, a, a little bit of... Um... Uh, back up to that here on, uh, I'm hoping you can see now, 
Uh, this is a uh, lesson from the solar winds attack on bank info security. Uh, NIST is really just down the street from where I grew up. Is that what you're seeing? Is, you see a big picture of NIST there? Am I showing it? Says, it's, it says Ames has started screen share, but it doesn't oh. appear that it's finished the oh, screen that's share. Interesting. Well, uh, then we're going to try a we're going to try a new share and see if that doesn't uh, that doesn't help. Can we see that now? I think yeah, I have a NIST. Yeah, a picture of NIST. Yep. So I actually went to school in Boulder, where NIST is. This is a great hill right there where these guys hang out. Um, but uh, CISA, uh, Jay Gasly at CISA, really with the solar winds attack, he he. He is now making this statement. Our takeaway from this attack is that identity is everything now. And um, that's really going to bring up where we, uh, where we start to kick in with a, a, a zero trust program that understands that the perimeter, as you said, Grant, has become microscopic, really. Yeah. And it's, it's around the identity and it's around the resource, but it doesn't change the fact that we have a whole lot of attack surface, right? Um, but the attack surface, can you see my, uh, my PowerPoint yep. now? Yep, okay. there, it's up for me. Terrific. So uh, where, where Checkpoint is really excelling is, is getting us that foundation to bring in all those elements, all of those moving parts of where uh, any sort of threat uh, an attack uh, and compromise might take place and being able to understand it, uh, respond to it and remediate it. And where secure auth kicks in is to go out to that perimeter, which is now the identity and provide the security where we're most vulnerable. A over 80, I think it's actually moved up to 90% of breach attacks are happening because passwords and user identity has been compromised primarily through phishing on uh, the dark web. When we, when we can't intercept that user, that user becomes the greatest threat we have. And the user is the one that we need to start to understand and wrap our heads around that identity. Any comments there, any thoughts or any, anything around that? Any add-in? Terrific. Interrupt me if you can. Love to have a conversation with you about it. So what we're going to do about that is we're going to put up the most um, secure journey for that user so that we can enable the rest of the security framework. And we do that using technology. And then we are going to increase security from feeling pretty good about our secure position to knowing that that identity perimeter has been secured. We're going to do that by looking at where we have come from in technology over on the left, where we just simply inconvenience the user. As I was describing, that notion of zero trust is we don't trust any user, and therefore we heap all of the responsibility onto the user. Well, what we found is, is that the workforce or the employees all of a sudden they weren't that happy about it. And by the way, we are that workforce. I'm not happy about it. I hate changing passwords. I'm the worst at passwords. You can show me your password and it's a secure event because I can't remember yours because I can't even remember my password. How am I going to know how to get yours? Unfortunately, the bad guys have much better memory, don't they? So yeah, I just use the same one on everything. It's easier. Sure. Well, that's convenient, right? And convenience is all that matters. Oop, I stepped on my keyboard. I got so excited. So what we found out was when you inconvenience users, they join the black hat team, okay? Inconvenience users become less secure. Those long passwords, what did they do with them? Anybody have guesses? Now that I'm on presenter mode, I'm not seeing the chat as well. Yeah, yellow stickies. Yeah, yellow stickies. That's exactly what happened, right? Yep. And we, we joke about it as security professionals, but we um, but it was reality, right? And then 
I can't get into this software because I'm not supposed to be in. Hey, you, would you mind sharing your password with me? Sure, no problem. No problem. The security team is my enemy anyway. They're probably yours. So what we learned was we can't just do what's on the left. We can't just block a user that really should be getting in. Of course, we can't let in a bad guy. So where SecureAuth has spent all of its R&D and all of its resources is understanding not just the user's uh, black and white, but the context around that login. What's going on with the login? Where is the user coming from? Do we know the space? Is he in the office? Is she sitting at the same computer she's been at? Or is it a known threat? Gosh, this shows up on an Onion Network anonymous browser. Or all of a sudden we recognize this is coming from outside the US. We don't conduct anything on this system outside the US. We're just going to block that. We're not even going to collect credentials. Why? Because the more information that we give the bad guys, the more likely it is they'll can compromise that information. So we're not going to give them a username. We're not going to tell them that it was a bad login. We're not going to let someone type in a password. We're just not even going to let them see the login screen. They can't map it. They can't take a picture of it. They can't emulate it because we just say no. But if indeed all of those risk signals say, hey, this is likely a good guy, then what we want to do is assume that it's the 98% of good guys because that's what usually is logging into our system. Then we're going to look at business requirements and we're going to decide, do we need to elevate security a little bit? Is this as an, an administrator? Is this someone accessing a highly private system or a highly functional system in finance? Maybe we will ask for a little more proof and we might use multi-factor to do that. Or perhaps we're going to really make it easy and secure and go all the way to passwordless. Anybody have any comments on that, on that look, on that notion, on the heads with gears? Everybody's stomach's growling. They're, they're everybody's excited to... about our uh, about our, our eating. Yeah, that's great. So I guess I'll sort of wrap up and and toss it back to you, Grant, with this thought that the zero trust uh, journey starting back in 2010 started with notions like single sign on, where oddly we give one credential for accessing all our systems. That doesn't sound like zero trust, does it? But what it did do is it consolidated and made convenient. So then we realized, well, we're gonna to need to put up a barrier. We're gonna add two factors. We're gonna make you prove who you are with some other factor, something you are, something you know, something you have. Then we decided we need to get a little more specific. Why? Because regulation and compliance required it. And so all of a sudden now we need multi-factor. We wanna make sure that we have a knowledge base of understanding. But what we determined was that all of those things are just simply technologies. Adding adaptive to that is just another technology. What we need to do is focus on the user journey to make sure that we have the highest level of user journey and we have the best partner out of the user for our security. And we're doing that by using all of those things, those technologies, SSO, two-factor, multi-factor, adaptive technologies, and we're starting to make it more convenient for the user because that elevates security at the same time. And now what we're pushing into is the notion of understanding the full context, being able to take signals from Checkpoint and have those influence us before we log in. So we can start to push that perimeter back out. The identity perimeter is pushing back out and we're doing it without inconveniencing the user. So that's how the, the zero trust journey looks going forward. The notion of dynamic identity policies and continuous authentication, but it's invisible authentication really often. We take that context, we read those risk signals through events and we make a determination do we log this person out because we really think we made a mistake when we let them in? Or are they changing context and we need to elevate and we're going to add a little more biometric security to it? Yep. So that's the future of identity. I think, I think what we're all trying to achieve in you know, many other aspects of our IT efforts are you know, to achieve as little friction or frictionless 
in whatever path our users are going down, right? And certainly when you start to look at authentication and the maturity, um, I think that's that to me is what I think about as I watch that uh, timeline aims and I see that journey. It's about less friction, but tightening uh, the actual identity. So ladies and gentlemen, we'd love to have you speak out, even if it's to say, thanks, we're ready to move on, but unmute. And if there's any questions for Ames or I, or uh, any comments you want to make, love to hear them. So if you password list or you, um, you look at you know, some of the adapted behaviors, what happens when a trusted device, you know, your company laptop um, gets breached. You know, somebody down, somebody gets that phishing email, clicks on something, malware is now on their laptop. How can you then trust that laptop as one of those places of, of authentication? Well, obviously, now that it's been compromised, you can't, right? So uh, the, the, the nature of that uh, attack, someone's uh, now allowed uh, remote access to their laptop, uh, is going to, uh, first of all, we want to make sure that didn't happen in the first place, right? And uh, that's, the, that's the first perimeter. Once it has been compromised, uh, that's when we want to take a look at other adaptive signals and then decide, okay, we, we suspect what this looks like. So now instead of trusting only the laptop, if the laptop has been our factor, and of course, we want to make sure we've designed good security uh, around this, right? Where I'm assuming that what you're uh, talking about, is it Doran? Yes, it is. <laughs> Thanks, Doran. Uh, is that... Maybe we've uh, somehow enrolled that laptop as one of our uh, secure factors or one of our identity verifications, right? And maybe we've done it with some sort of a fingerprint or something like that. And so um, we, that is only one trust signal that we're going to read in that interaction. So as we take a look at it, let me see if I can get up a little visual here that will help uh, understand what that looks like. Um, we're going to actually uh, digest a heck of a lot more in risk signals to understand what's going on with that user access. So if this person's trying to move laterally, for example, off that laptop into a different system, uh, perhaps especially if that system is an administrative sort of system, or if that system is out of the nature of this user, uh, we're going to use some uh, behavioral understanding of that user. And we're going to say, you know what? We need something else to verify or validate this user. So maybe now we were trusting that laptop, but may maybe now we're going to ask for some other token. Maybe we ask for an unbound token uh, through FIDO, or maybe uh, we ask for something uh, like through the, the uh, biometric on the device that they're carrying. Uh, to access that system. Um, maybe they just simply violate a group uh, construct as they go uh, laterally within the system. Uh, and now we're also going to feed an alert that we see a behavioral change in this user. And uh, that's where uh, it really is a great combination with Checkpoint because not only are we sensing something on the context change, but Checkpoint is seeing uh, behavioral stuff and also uh, context-oriented things for access uh, where we might just arrest that process from that point. Does that help, Dorn, or agree, disagree? Feel free to disagree with the speakers. I think everybody's eager to get on to cooking chicken. Well, and I think Lauren is responding, but she's on mute, Grant. Yeah, there I know. Well, well, there well, she goes. Well, 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 my phone, my phone barked at me, and so I ran off to to uh, to mute that. It's like I I generally agree with you. I'm just concerned about the dwell time before we know something is malicious and identifying that behavior as a bad behavior um, with you know. The, the authentication for users. That's a really, that's a very important call out because there are technologies out there 
that are doing a post-authentication behavioral analysis and evaluation. And they're shooting an alert, right? They're doing a notify, um, but it, unfortunately, we've already allowed access. And so um, there are two things going on with that is one, we do need uh, uh, dynamic monitoring and excellent uh, DNR going on on the back end. But the way SecureAuth is validating that is we are doing the behavioral analysis before we grant the login at all. And we're responding then in a way that's gonna make sense for that user. And so when we look at what that looks like, we're looking at having a huge um, wallet of choices of how we're going to secure that interaction should we see some weird behaviors that are going to block that login before they even get in. So it's a combination. It's definitely uh, a, a, a group effort when it comes to security. And the reason that, that we partner uh, with Checkpoint is that we spend all day, every day investing in this, in this part, protecting where we're most vulnerable at the login. And, uh, and we trust that we also have excellent security wrapping that should something happen should something be uh, go through some sort of service account where we didn't get a chance to block it, that's where we could focus uh, our dynamic technologies to understand risk and mitigate and remediate. Does that okay. help? Yes. Thanks, Doran. So I'm. This is Mark. I'm going to jump in and actually um, end the recorded portion of this, so everybody can feel a little bit more comfortable to ask any questions that they may have. I want to thank um, Grant and Ames. Like you, uh, you guys knocked it out of the park yet again. Very awesome discussion, and we want to keep it going after I end this uh, recorded. But thank you. And if you have any questions, please reach out to an ADS uh, rep or myself, and we will get you sourced to the right place. Uh, thank you.